honey, if you walk past it, you tell the world it's okay. A leader doesn't mean having a title or occupying a corner office. You know, it means using the influence and choice that we all have every day um, to have a positive uh, impact in people's lives. But we need to stop this comparison because it robs all the joy and it robs all the possibility. And, and the best advice I can give you comes from a mentor of mine, Jane, Jane Chuson, uh, an incredible social impact leader who always talks to me about the idea of you've got to put yourself where the lightning strikes. G'day, g'day. Welcome back to another episode of A Lot To Talk About. It is, of course, your boy, the captain of the ship, the man in charge, Bradley J. Driver. You can call me Brad. Blessed to be here with a guest who I've been so excited to sit down with now for a while. We actually booked this like three or four months ago, but she's one of the busiest women on the planet doing so much. And that's why this intro was so hard to think about what I'd actually chat about, what I'd sort of, what titles I'd bring up. Because today we have a speaker. We have an author, we have an MC, and I'm talking MC and interviewed some of the biggest names in the world, like Richard Branson, for example. We have someone who is an innovator and a leader of change. But above all, when I sat down and really thought about who today's guest was, we have a human being with a deep desire to do good in the world, and then an actual intention and a focus on not just thinking about it, but doing it, acting it out. And so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, give a very warm welcome from your home, your car, or wherever you are, to the one, the only, Mrs. Holly Ransom. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. It's great to be here. Honestly, it's such a pleasure, Holly, because as I sit and I continue to look at your work and what you do, I'm just marveled at it because in the speaking world, in the MC world, in the world of interviewing people, there's so much to learn and to know, to do it well and to do it effectively. And you do such a bloody good job of it. And I've not had the privilege of seeing you speak yet in person. I've seen plenty of videos online and heard plenty of pods and, you know, all of that. But I can't wait until I get to experience that one day because I think there's a lot for me to learn from you. And I know that the audience who are just like I am, just like you are, hungry to learn and hungry to figure out the pieces of the puzzle that they can take and put into their own journey, put into the picture of their own lives are going to learn so much from you as am I today. So I really thank you for being here and taking the time. Oh, I really appreciate that introduction and, and it's mutual. I really look forward to the opportunity to share a stage together and to get to watch you in action as well. Um, I think that's one of the things that's that's a great part of being in the industry that we're in and certainly or the attitude I have towards the industry that we're in is that you're always learning. Every opportunity to sit in an audience and watch someone do their thing and tell their stories is an opportunity to learn and grow yourself in, in how you do your craft and, and how you try and move and inspire others and connect with hearts and minds. So I look forward to watching you as well. No, amazing. You're too kind. I guess I wanted to kick off today's chat with a little bit of a congratulations because for all you've achieved on a career level, you had a very beautiful human experience recently. I just seen you were married. So and congratulations. Like the first time I've been referred to as Mrs. in your introduction, I was like, oh, well done. That yeah. happened two weeks ago. So yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, officially a married woman. It was just um, the most spectacular of days uh, for anyone who uh, gets to experience a moment like that in their lives or has experienced a moment in their lives like that. It was just um, truly the, the most I can describe my heart being completely full, if not overflowing uh, from mm. a standpoint of joy and gratitude and and love and it's so beautiful i think you know it's rare in life sadly probably to get to sit in those moments where we're really overcome by that set of wonderful emotions um yeah, power to people where that's regular i think that's a fabulous thing but i think all too often you know the the news cycle the busyness the everything else drags us out of that so it was really just i feel like i've been in cloud nine for a couple of weeks it's been great that's amazing how does that experience and i guess you know, marriage isn't the first sign of love or the first feeling of love and connection to your partner because you've had to do things well to get to that point. But how does that, I guess that very real and, you know, exciting moment, how does that change the way you look at life, think about what you're trying to do and what you're trying to change in the world? And how does that change and inspire evolution in you as a human? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, it's a really frustrating thing when you hear the phrase and, and you're single and you're dating and you're hoping to meet the right person. Oh, you know, when you when you meet them, you'll know. Or when you find it, it'll, it'll knock your socks off. Whatever these lines people tell you, which are sort of infuriating to hear when you're single. And I remember being similarly infuriated. And then I did meet the one, my, my wife, Kate, and uh, I, I knew exactly what they'd been talking about all those years. 
And I think in, in that moment, the transformation starts and there's something quite remarkable about meeting your, your person, your other half, whatever, my, my better half as I describe her, but certainly however you want to describe that person. Cause I think there's an extraordinary, and I can only speak to my experience, but my experience is that there's an extraordinary safety and confidence that comes with that. When I look at the person that I've been since we've been together, um, there's, uh, you know, I often describe, and I think I, I said this in my vows, you know, she makes me feel like I could touch the stars just by standing on my tiptoes. There's this extraordinary expansive strength that comes from feeling so loved exactly as you are. Mm. And I think that's the remarkably empowering thing of unconditional love is you know that you're enough just as you are. And in that you are given the freedom to be all that you choose to want to be. And so I think that's the, the really evolutionary thing about love in that way, in the way that it's evolving my life. I think the beautiful thing people say, does marriage feel different? It actually does, I think. Um, and I think, again, it's probably just an even greater level of security, stability, um, surety in one another and what you're doing together and the commitment that you've made. Uh, so, you know, I'm excited to watch, that's only two weeks old. I'm excited to watch how that will wash through my life and how that might change things again. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And I, I truly hope, you know, I grew up with the most remarkable grandparents who were together 70 years before my grandpa sadly passed last year. And I watched love like that for a really long time. And I had always dreamed and hoped and wished that I might find it, but was never sure it was in the path for my life. And for anyone who's in that point of, of questioning that, just keep the faith. You, um, you'd be surprised what's around the corner if you stay doing the work on being the best version of you, um, who yeah. will be put in your path to, to join you on the journey. Very, very true words, because I've recently experienced this myself, not marriage, but the connection, the love, the safety and security, as you mentioned. And it's, I think it's funny because you hear, you said there, you mentioned something really important, doing the work yourself. And I felt like as my late teens come about, there's a lot of insecurity, you know, skin starts breaking out you start to look at yourself in the mirror and compare yourself to others and you beat yourself up more than you lift yourself up often through those years of comparison and, and struggle, which is so sad. And I built a lot of deep seated fear and insecurity and in what my future with love looked like. And I worked a lot on that myself for the last couple of years. Cause I noticed it was having an impact on, you know, my ability to meet people and my connection with people. And I'm glad I did, but I, I will say, whilst I worked on it a lot myself, meeting my partner now, Sov, and feeling that connection, feeling that safety and vulnerability and the security that comes with it. And funnily enough, meeting her and like very quickly having a huge pimple, like the biggest pimple you've ever seen in your life come up my face within a couple of weeks of meeting her and her being so relaxed about it and like, I don't value, she's like, you know, I love you. I love the way you look, but I don't value for that. I value for who you are. And that safety and that security has allowed me then to take that self-work to even the next level. Mm. And there's almost this, for me, this like perception out there in society that, you know, we hear it so often, uh, don't meet someone if you've got to do work on you. But I think a lot of the hard work comes when you meet someone because those deep-seated fears and insecurities even more so come to the surface. And if you have the right person, you can take huge strides in the right direction of self-development and growth. Totally. And I'm so happy that that's happened for you and for Thank you and Soph together. And, and I think it's, for me, it's a yes and. Like I, I sort of think you have to be doing the work on yourself. And I think mm. it's an interesting pattern, you know, we can see out there the idea that a relationship is going to fix things or be a band-aid on something and the reality is that that's always going to come that's not going to be a sustainable solution to everything if you haven't done the work and and you know by doing the work it's reading the books it's doing the self-reflection it's going and talking to someone it's finding whatever your chosen path is i think sometimes we use the phrase doing the work and it's important to talk about like what the work is yeah. uh, but I, I think to your point the work doesn't stop when you meet that person you know i think one of the the great things and I've got mentors in life, I've got mentors in business, I've got mentors in love. When I look at their relationship, you know, and, and how they've grown together, how much they love each other deep into their relationship and the quality of how they've raised their family. And when I look at those people, they've continued to do the work so that they've grown 
separately, but importantly together. And, and I think that's really critical too. And it is, there's something about partnership with someone else that will, will pull up new things and both wonderful things. And also things where you're like, wow, okay, that's something for me to lean into and go and investigate. I didn't even know that was there. So it's, it's a bit of both, I think. Definitely beautifully said. And I guess to sort of segue from that into life and, and getting to the point where you're at now, like I said, in the introduction, in the early stage of the podcast, you're doing so many incredible things, but that doesn't happen overnight. And I also recognize that there's probably things personally along the way, challenges that you found and faced that have inspired you to become a leader of change. Let's talk about, I guess, the foundational years of your life, childhood, you know, your earlier years. If you want to give us a rough idea of what that picture looked like and what sort of started to create the human being that is Holly Ransom. <laughs> I think uh, the, the best answer I can give is I was very lucky for two things. I was very lucky to have quite remarkable grandparents and a particularly remarkable grandmother. And then I was very lucky for the teachers and educators that were in my life uh, from a very young age, primary school, and then certainly through high school, who saw something in me well before I knew there was anything to be seen in myself and really encouraged and pushed me to take on leadership roles, to, to do extracurricular programs that exposed me to thinking and ideas that just catapulted my, um, my development as a leader and my interest in what I was able to do in the world. But I, I really do think it started with my grandmother. I mean, she is a force. Uh, she's, what is she now? She'll be 90, gosh, 92 this year. And yeah, wow. uh, she's always been an incredible kind of moral compass for me. And I remember quite vividly my earliest memory, which I think is sort of something that burned um, into my DNA, sort of what's become, I guess, a, a reference point for me and how I've made decisions from that point in my life onwards. We were shopping in a supermarket in in Perth, where I, where I grew up in, in Scarborough. And there was a man who was a giant at that age of my life. I would have been four or five. He looked enormous. Uh, and he was yelling at the woman, uh, the teenage girl who had was checking him out at the checkout. She'd given him the wrong change. And this guy was really laying into her and letting, letting her know about it. And before I could blink, my like four, four and a half foot, five foot grandmother had inserted herself between said giant and this young girl on the checkout and pointed her finger up at him and said, how dare you talk to that young woman like that? You apologize. And I don't think this guy had ever been told off in his life because he, you know, took a second to take that in and went a little bit, you know, flushed in the cheeks and mumbled sorry and grabbed his stuff and wandered out of the store. And grandma proceeded like nothing had happened, paid for bread and milk or whatever we were getting and went to go out of the store before she realized I was still back in the queue, sort of, <laughs> sort of wetted, uh, fixed to the ground watching all this play out. And she came back to grab me and I said, grandma, that was so brave and said to me, something I, I didn't understand the full weight of till much later in life but she said honey if you walk past it you tell the world it's okay and what i've i've come back to that moment many times in my life since because i don't think and it's often only with the benefit of reflection and and maturity we can work out what some of these earliest memories i think they leave breadcrumbs for who we are and what we what matters to us the things that we recall um, from early in our life because they stick for a reason and when I think about that moment, I think it was powerful for a couple of reasons. The, the first was my grandma had no authority in the context of that day to do what she did. She wasn't store manager. She wasn't even, you know, the size of this guy. She wasn't, she wasn't anything that kind of meant that she should insert herself. And she didn't think twice about stepping in to do the right thing. And for me, that was a really significant reframe on what it means to be a leader. A leader doesn't mean having a title or occupying a corner office. You know, it means using the influence and choice that we all have every day um, to have a positive uh, impact in people's lives, whether we're doing that at scale in an organization, whether we're talking about the influence we've got on our kids or our friends, um, whether we're talking about uh, the way that we're doing that in our communities. Mm. And so for me, that was a really important reset that we all have moments we can step into every day and lead. I think the second thing was that she, she didn't tell me, she did it. And I think in a world where it's really easy to kind of talk and there's so much information and it's pretty overwhelming. What I loved about grandma that day is she didn't tell me if you walk past it, you tell it's okay, it, you know, tell the world it's okay. She just went on and did it. And from the earliest moment in my life, I knew what that meant because I saw it in action in front of me. 
So I think that was really significant. And when I look at the choices that I've made in, in my life and career, it can pretty much to a T link them back to when I saw something that I didn't think was okay and I wasn't prepared to walk past it. I thought, how do I dig my heels in here and try and do something? So that's a lot of the choices I've made with the organizations I've gotten involved with, the things I've said yes to, where I've chosen to volunteer, all that sort of stuff. It comes back to what grandma taught me. And then I think it comes back to the encouragement of my teachers that, you know, I could be a part of the solution and, and really pushing me to, to step into my ability to make a difference. I love that you went there because as you were saying that story, that quote that you gave there, that, that your grandma so beautifully delivered to you through action and then words was something I was going to bring up because I noticed that's a big part of everything you do. Like I see it in your speaking work. I see it on online. You share about that a lot. And that seems like it's become your life mantra in many ways. And I guess I, I relate to that so much because when I was born with cystic fibrosis, my parents went to, which, you know, many listeners of the show will know this. Um, my parents went to their first ever specialist appointment and, you know, I think I was maybe a month or two old at the time. And he said, your son would be better off with a terminal illness that would kill him or he'd get over. This will ruin his life. And they got up, walked away and never seen that doctor again and went and found someone who had a more positive view. And at the time, I obviously didn't recognize it. But in hindsight, now looking back, hearing those stories and seeing the way that they lived and pushed that message to me through their actions, through the way that they were as parents. For me, it's the greatest lesson I could have ever learned in life that what you believe is what you'll become. Mm. And that's essentially become my mantra in everything I do in life is if you believe it, if you put in the work, you become what you one day believed and hoped you would be. And, you know, I, I love so much that, you know, it's probably a perfect segue to speak about belief. And then the way that your grandmother was with you, the way that she's inspired that in you, then cements that belief from both the intrinsic and then internally that you can achieve the things necessary to inspire that change. Mm. And you've gone on to do so many incredible things that really do align with that message. And was it first in law? Was that your first career move? Yeah, sorry, I was just going to say before that, that gave me goosebumps hearing that story about your parents. That's so amazing. And I, I love um, I love that mantra that you've got. And I think there's there's also something really powerful in that for not taking other people's opinions on and their self-limiting beliefs and projections and allowing that to become your reality. Mm. Um, you know, that, that whole notion that if, if you don't kind of own your life story, someone else is going to pick up the pen for you. Um, the, the power of making sure, you know, you, you are determining what true North looks like. You're determining what the definition of your capabilities is. That's just such a powerful lesson to have learned um, so early in, in life and what incredible role models your parents sound like uh, for the way that they were just never going to settle for anything less than the best life that they could give you. So that's unreal. Oh, honestly, I am so grateful. The biggest blessing I have in my life is that I had the most incredible family around me who are still super, super close with me, like adore my dad, my mum, and my sister so much. They're, they've basically given me the gift of the gift of life, not just through birth, but through belief. Mm. And essentially now what was not supposed to be my reality has become, you know, just an incredible life, a life that is so for me, like has inspired change now in so many others through the belief that they first inspired within me. So I'm very grateful. And when I hear you talk about your grandmother, I see that in, in my family too. And those positive traits of great and just beautiful role models we're so lucky to have. And, and, and it's why, you know, as I'm sitting here, I almost have a little bit of, a little bit of sadness for the people who haven't had that from their parents or their grandparents. But I think it makes what you do in your work so much more important because for so many people, you will be that person. Well, that's very kind, but I think the thing I would say for people who are in that situation um, and it, it's more common than, than we think, sadly. And, and I think the thing I would encourage you uh, to do is find community, find your people out there in the world. I think one of the best early lessons I got from a mentor uh, who shared this line on stage, you know, how long does it take to learn from someone's lifetime of experience? Coffee. Like it is as simple as sitting down and having a 
coffee conversation. And there was something so empowering about that line for me because for whatever silly reason at that point in my life, I had somehow internalized that people weren't that approachable or I needed to have a really good reason or I could only reach out to people that were sort of at the same age and stage of, of life as me or something like that. And there was something so liberating about that idea of, oh my God, like I, I can ask people to have coffee and that's not a big imposition and I can come having prepared my questions and the things that I know would make a really big difference uh, for me to understand. And you'll be surprised, you know, um, in those conversations, you'll have people that you just connect with and people that resonate with you and what you're trying to do and want to support you and encourage you. And if you don't have those people in your life, make it one of your 2023 things that you're going to go find them. You don't need a lot. You just need a handful. Um, and it starts by not, you know, going in. I actually think we need to lower the bar. It's not going and seeking mentors. Start with having coffee conversations. It's doable. Mm. It's easy. It's not as scary. And then in those conversations, when you've got a connection uh, with, with people like that, say, hey, I really valued our conversation. Is there any chance that when I've taken on the advice that you've shared with me today, I could come back and we could sit down and talk about next steps and turn it into something that becomes more regular? Um, there is no reason that we, any of us should be going through life without those people that want to be cheer squad leaders, sponsors, sounding boards for us. They're out there. So make it your mission to find it because it will change your world. I love that so much. Great message. Great message. And I'm sure you found plenty of those people throughout the course of your career and life. When you sort of took your first steps out into the world of working, it was law, am I correct? Yeah, I, I kind of did a, <laughs> I was a bit of a strange worker in that regard. Like my first job was in the back back room of a surf shop. And then I was quickly into the world of event management, which was an incredible, when I think back, initiation by fire in the world of leadership, sort of as a 15, 16 year old leading teams um, of people that were more often, you know, 10, 15 years older than me uh, in, in a very wide range of sort of different event environments. So that was a good uh, initiation to the world of, of work and leadership. And then I did a law degree and I worked as a paralegal uh, for a couple of years of that. And then I was lucky enough to get picked up by uh, Sam Walsh, who was CEO of Rio Tinto at the time. And I took a role working with him, which was sort of an MBA in uh, in, in in practice, I guess, effectively mm -hmm. getting that opportunity to, to do that and uh, was doing a lot of volunteering work. This is while I was still studying. So this is still, I was doing my degree, doing a lot of volunteering work and then um, was fortunate to get the call from the prime minister's office, asked to chair the, the youth summit for the G20, which sort of took me out of Perth and over the East coast and um, really changed the trajectory of a lot of things, getting the opportunity to, to do something at that scale that um, was, just such an initiation uh, by fire into the world of government and policy and working with such an array of stakeholders. And um, yeah, that was sort of the, the catalyst to move west to east and the start of a whole different chapter. Yeah, wow, just incredible. And, you know, it's it's so true in life that quite often what we originally set out to do is not what we end up Absolutely. doing and being remarkable in, but it's it's figuring out and being present enough to pick up the clues along the way of where life's trying to lead you. And to me, it sounds like because of your intention and great connection of purpose, you're able to scout these opportunities as you move through life that become a part of the fabric of who you are and, you know, the fabric of the legacy that you'll leave behind, you know, in future when your career's over and, you know, when hopefully in many, many, many years to come when, you know, it's the end of your time and you sit back and reflect on a life really well lived, it makes me think a lot about purpose, you know, and I, I feel so purpose driven towards what I do and actually identifying and crafting, identifying what purpose meant to me and then crafting a purpose for my life has pushed me and fueled my progress in ways more than I could have ever imagined before truly understanding the power of it. Very simple question, but a very deep one. What would you identify as your purpose in life? For me, um, I've always been uh, passionate about how how we change the leadership game and how we lift individuals to the full extent of their potential and by doing so, communities to the full extent of their potential. So I'm very mm. interested in that force multiplier. I spent a lot of years working in strategy and you'd create these grand visions of how you've had impact and then you'd see them sit in a drawer in someone's office and never get realised or you'd see them 
be uh, given to teams to lead that were not equipped with the capabilities or could not inspire the followership to get the thing done. And so they fell by the wayside and these great plans that everyone was so excited about that were gonna make really big changes in people's lives never saw the light of day. Um, and so I think for me, that's when the Delta shifted to how do we actually help more people believe in themselves, build their capability, and then combine those two things to lead to impact in the world. And that's sort of the equation that I'm very passionate about playing a role in. The thing that landed for me with what you were saying before too, though, is that um, there are two parts to me. There's knowing your purpose, and that's a really powerful exercise. Uh, and the best advice I can give people on that, because some people know it, I remember I grew up with kids who sort of frustratingly knew it. They knew they wanted to be a doctor or they knew they wanted to be a lawyer. I was like, how do these people know? Like, I wasn't one of those kids that knew like that. And, and the best advice I can give you comes from a mentor of mine, Jane, Jane Chewson, uh, an incredible social impact leader who always talks to me about the idea of you've got to put yourself where the lightning strikes. Um, so you need to actually go and try and be in the places where your purpose might hit you. Your purpose is not going to hit you sitting on the couch binging Netflix. You are going to have to get out there and have a go. You're going to have to go and, you know, volunteer to take on work experience somewhere. You're going to have to, um, yeah, put yourself forward in, in a voluntary organization and get involved in a, in a mission related cause. You have to try a side hustle and see if it actually gives you your passion and purpose or put pen to paper and write that novel you've always been dreaming about. Whatever it is, you've actually got to put yourself out there. And, and so I think, which kind of relates to part two for me, you're, your purpose can't be passive. Like if you want mm. to be able to um, feel that excitement, you have to put yourself where lightning strikes to find it. And then you've sort of got to be prepared to take the risk or have a go or make the choices um, that allow you to keep living in line with it. Um, there was a line I had written on my mirror for a number of years. Uh, so I would look at it every day from an accountability standpoint. And it was one from Steve Jobs where um, it said every day for um, a number of years, I woke up and I asked myself, do I love what I'm going to go do today? And if the answer was no for too many days in a row, I knew something had to change. And the reason I wrote that on my mirror, because I was at a career inflection point at that moment, and I wanted to stay like, really accountable to the way I was navigating choices and the options that were sitting in front of me. And are they going to light me up? Do I love what I'm going to go choose to do today? You know, what are the choices that are going to allow me to build a, build a life I love? Because if I'm living a life that I love, I'm going to be um, fired up every day. I'm going to bring the best of myself to what I'm doing. Um, now I'm talking from a place of privilege that I get to talk about the idea of designing a life that way. And I acknowledge that. Um, but for those who have that choice and option, um, it, that is the best set of advice that I can give. Um, is to think about how do you put yourself where lightning strikes? And then secondly, how do you kind of make sure you're actively using your purpose as a filter criteria for the options um, that are over, that are, that are in front of you at any decision point? Yeah, I absolutely love that. And I know that for so many people, they feel, and, and I think this is the issue with um, the world that we're in, right? Content speaking, um inspiring change through podcasts, you know, writing, you know, reading all of the, all the people who are taking on inspiration in the world seem to be motivated for a moment and then don't have access to the follow through, like what keeps them accountable in the follow through. And I think it's often the challenge for people is things have been made too difficult for them to understand process. And I know sometimes I've sat in crowds and listened to people speak and gone, I'm not really comprehending how I'm going to make that easy to integrate. Well, not, not necessarily easy. Yeah, that's right. not the best word, but actually, you know, how am I going to integrate that into my life? But I love what you said there because it has simplicity and effectiveness. And I think that's what we need as human beings. We need something that in our busy, crazy lives we can bleed in because not everyone can do what I did and leave their job and sell their house to go throw themselves into their passion. You know, people have families to support and, obligations but I think because of those obligations and challenges in their life they've put up these roadblocks that purpose isn't for them that you know well I'm just an ordinary human being so I don't have this higher purpose in life that's for celebrities or sports stars or you know thought leaders but the truth of it is we all have purpose we all have purpose that can be so impactful and so enriching to others that can serve others on a higher level and I think Firstly, recognizing that and recognizing the fact that we're all ordinary people, we're all skin and bone, 
but we all have the power to do extraordinary things when we connect with that. And I love the way that you've simplified it there because it is so important for people to put themselves in a position to recognize it first. Mm. And that for me is the issue for a lot of people. They've not had a taste of it. It's hard to know what you love if you don't give yourself an opportunity to taste, right? And and the other thing for me is what I think we're in this interesting space where we're allowing, we're, we're trapped in like purpose comparison maybe. And so there's a sense that, my purpose has to look like X or be at Y level to be able to be meaningful and significant enough. And the, the thing I would say back to people, there is no more meaningful a purpose than being a, a person of great values, you know, mm. however you define your values, being a really great, like you've described, a really great son, a really great brother, a really great friend, a really great colleague, you know, a person of respect and integrity or who brings joy to people's lives or who makes people laugh or whatever way you define what's important. Being a really great parent is arguably one of the most important and powerful leadership roles any of us will ever take on in our lives. So this idea that purpose has to be um, bigger and we're getting in this comparison of it has to be about millions of dollars or running X, Y, Z, or I've, it doesn't have to look like that. And I think it's unfortunate with the social media age that we're in and, and kind of the the inherent nature of how that then uh, compares people one to the other, that that's maybe the headspace that we're in. Um, so I'd encourage people that this is an entirely individual exercise. Um, and I agree with you, everyone's got a purpose and even the ability to tap into that and remind yourself that the reason you're going to work every day and working your butt off is because you're, you know, being a great role model or provider or champion for, or however you want to define it, it will elevate the way that you do everything you already do, because it will give you a totally different way of identifying with it. So there's really great power in that reset, but we need to stop this comparison because it robs all the joy and it robs all the possibility. Yeah. So beautifully said, it makes me think, do you think that, that, that comparison the fact that we are so harsh on ourselves and so uncompassionate to ourselves in what maybe our personal purpose would be or what impact we can have in the world. Like you said there before, when you spoke about inspiring leadership, that it's about inspiring leadership in someone who then can lead and inspire so many others along the way. It makes me think of the mother Teresa quote, you know, not everyone has the power to change the world, but we all have the power to change the world of one person. And that is, you know, that just has a follow on effect. I, I wonder if it's that sense of comparison and that sense of disbelief in our own capability, our own recognition of purpose that is challenging people to feel as though making change or making significant change in the world is too much of a challenge. And I know that change is a big part of what you do, inspiring change to make the world a better place for us to live, to enjoy life, to, to succeed and flourish. What do you think it is that is that roadblock for people to feel like they can be a part of the change? I think it's it's a bit of an overwhelming age, whether we're overwhelmed because of the sheer busyness of our lives and the demands of our time on our time, or whether we're overwhelmed by the scale of the problem. You know, I was reading a, a study not too long ago that came out of or the BBC published the study, it was a UK study. They were saying, you know, that 54% of Gen Z experience anxiety on a daily basis because of the state of the climate and, and the climate reality, you know, whether it's about um, the science projections or whether it's about sort of a failure of world leaders to really move with any sense of momentum towards um, a, a, well, a faster and um, more robust transition to net zero. But you look at things like that and you, you go, it's, it's understandable. You know, when I think about what we need to drive change, there needs to be a catalyst, uh, a catalytic event, whether that's a moment of belief, whether that's a moment of loss, you know, there's a whole range of things that can catalyze the desire for, for change. But I think when we're sitting in a negative headspace or when we are feeling a state of overwhelm, it's very difficult to then have the level of resolve and energy we need to bring willpower to bear and do something different or to set out there and be ambitious enough to believe that we can be a part of a new way forward. So I think the thing I often talk to people about is, you know, how do we refocus on the one small step we can do uh, each day? It's a bit like the thing I would observe, you often say, how do you be happy? 
Well, it's hard to flick on the happy switch, but what you can do is be grateful. And when you're grateful and you're focusing on things you're grateful for, you cannot coexist in gratitude with a negative emotion. It is just impossible. Because when we're in a moment of reflecting on all the things that are great in our life, it might not get as extreme as happy every time you do it, but you're absolutely are sitting in the positive end of the, the emotional spectrum. And I think there's something to be said too about change. One of the greatest ways to start is to start with momentum and then momentum will drive belief. So mm. the idea of going, what can I do today? Um, and whether you're defining that for a step you're taking towards something in your career, whether it's something that you want to try and make an impact on out there in the community or a bigger social issue, start with what's right under your feet. Um, because we have an enormous psychological benefit that comes with feeling like we're making progress. And so one of the things I say to people who feel stuck is to start and start small and to build this sense of momentum. Uh, and that will really help arrest the sense of overwhelm and make the possibility of change seem easier day by day. It's not going to happen overnight, but you will notice an incremental difference. And then all of a sudden it will become a different story that you're telling yourself. So sometimes you can change the story first. Sometimes it's easier to start um, making a different story real. And then the story starts to change off the back of it. Yeah. I love that. And I love what you said about start with what's under your feet, because, you know, so often I think, you know, and I'm so guilty of it. I rock up to get a coffee in the morning. I love a coffee. It's like one of my favorite things, just going to grab a coffee in the morning and it's the best, right? And I rock up the same cafe every day, Lee and me, and I walk in and I think, I've got three keep cups at home. How on earth did I forget again to bring one of them here to grab my coffee today? And then I think, well, oh, with so much going on, is one keep cup going to make a difference? But it's that mentality that can push change in the right direction or the wrong direction. If it's, if it's there for me, if it's an opportunity every day, that's an effort I need to make. It's right under my feet. It's one way that I can just make an impact every day that might inspire one other person to make an impact. And for me, it comes back to values. And I listened to a really good podcast the other day, a guy named Steve Perry. He wrote a book called The Chimp Paradox. I've not actually read the book, so I won't claim that I have, but I listened to the podcast and got a really good sense of what this guy was talking about as a psychologist and has worked worked both clinically um, in hospitals and in outpatient rooms. He's worked with sporting teams and, you know, sports stars. And he spoke about how we build self-esteem. And he said that self-esteem can be built effortlessly by understanding our values and then just living by our values every day. And he said a lot of people get down on themselves and start to negatively affect their self-esteem by Oh, I wasn't that kind today and kindness is one of my values. Then he said, it's rewiring your brain to go, well, that was my chimp brain in overdrive in overwhelm. So come back to my human brain, come back to the computer. I want to be kind. So I'm going to be kind the next opportunity I get. And that is just that working with what's under your feet, right? Okay. Making that the first step. And I think we're so harsh on ourselves that we live so much in the past and fail to see what's there in front of us in the present as an opportunity to be better and to be a part of that change. And so I love the way you explain it there because it is really the simple things in life. It's a simple task that build that momentum. And it's, you know, I know you've run two Ironmans or not run, but swam, cycled and ran um, through two full Ironmans and, you know, starting with the first steps, right? It's taking whatever step you can in the direction. You don't just rock up to an Ironman and complete it. You know, you start okay. small and you build up, you build momentum. Because I remember one of the, the first things my coach taught me was if you are focused on the finishing line, you won't cross it. Um, so it is just too far away, too big. And if that's what you're trying to use as your motivational tool from the starting line, um, it, it'll just loom too large and too unconquerable to be able to be the source of inspiration. So you have to find a way and, and you play games with yourself of how you break down these giant, massive chunks of that race into really achievable steps. So you can celebrate every two Ks or five Ks and things like that. And you can tell yourself you're making progress. And it's really only when you're at about the 37 K mark of the final leg of the marathon that you allow yourself to, to think about that finish line. Now there's a sense of, you know, where you're going, right? There is mm. a, a, a build of, I want to cross that damn finish line. And this this means something to me, but if that needs to be held in tension, that long-term vision, dream impact, you want to have goal, you want to achieve with, that how am I going to chip away at it? And what are the milestones that I'm going to make 
that are much closer. Um, there's this line that I've always liked where it's like, you might, you might only be able to see as far as the headlights, but you can make the whole journey that way. And you need headlight goals as much as you need the end destination at the back of your mind of where you're heading and, and ultimately where the, where the drive's taking you. I love, I heard this quote once, which reminds me so much of what you said just there. Um, I heard this guy reference a quote that he read in a book and I didn't realize I ended up going to get the book because I thought the quote was so profound. And I realized it was actually quite like a children's sort of book, but like with adult messaging in it, there was beautiful pictures. It was called The Boy, The Fox and the Horse, I believe. Yeah. I, this is my sister-in-law's favorite book. I, yeah. I've heard all about this. Yeah. It's like, it's very small and it's very beautifully illustrated, but it's got Incredible really meaningful messages. Yeah. And one of the messages in the book was, you know, the forest is thick and dense and I can't see through the other side. And then the wise horse, I believe it is, says, well, can you see your next step? And the boy goes, yes. And he says, well, just take that. And I think, you know, that just reminded me of that there. And, you know, as far as our next step, I guess the next step of this episode is to come to a conclusion because I know that you've got a busy schedule today. I want to just leave the audience with that one last piece of conclusion, that one little nugget of wisdom to take, attach themselves to, and then go out and live it and be it. And so a question I want to ask you, Holly, which I have some idea of maybe what it might be the answer is if you could encourage the world with one message and, you know, you could encourage them to act on it, to take it on as a part of who they are and their identity, what would that message be? I think I would say do one thing today that your future self will thank you for. Interpret that however you might like. But I think one of the things that when we think about our future self, we think about, we, we naturally call to our mind, you know, the aspiration of us down the line, whether that's, you know, you know where we want to be professionally or personally, but I think naturally it invites more expansively the impact we want to have in the world. And so I think when we ask ourselves that question, we start to, to sprinkle these little breadcrumbs of, or seeds, probably more accurately in the context of this metaphor, you know, for things that are going to sprout and, and produce um, seeds, fruit, wonderful um, things for the world, for the community, for our families down the line. And I think sometimes we delay those things because the view is the, the timing's not perfect. You know, that the ducks haven't lined up. I don't have the situation in place to start the dream I've always believed in, or I don't have the capacity with my job to be able to volunteer on the cause that I'm really passionate about and would love to make an impact on or whatever the, the excuses that we have for the reasons we tell ourselves that we can't make a start. And so the thing I would say it speaks to what we were talking about earlier, start with what's under your feet. What's the one small thing you can do today that future self will thank you for. It could be as simple as reaching out to someone that you know, it could be a really a great addition to your tribe that could be a, an inspiring, supportive mentor as you navigate the next chapter. All of us could do that today. That'll take you five minutes to email someone and tell them why you'd love to sit down with them and lock in that coffee conversation. So make it simple but start that pattern of what's one thing I can do today that my future self and by extension, future others will thank me for. I absolutely love that. I want to say thank you so much for being here. I also want to thank your beautiful grandmother for being an incredible role model, a leader to you because she's, in, she's inspired a human being who's having so much impact on the world, having so much impact on myself. You know, I know the listeners and the viewers of today's podcast and I'm so excited to not only you know, share this out with the world, but continue to watch your journey, continue to connect and hopefully one day share a stage um, in the very near right future. Right Can't wait to when we yeah. get to do it in person. Definitely. Thank you so much, Holly. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much, Brad. Cheers.